Great. So my name is Eric Luis Garcia. I will be today's host for the Industrial Transformation Platform Seminar. And it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker of the day, uh, Anna Jason from uh, Vattenfall. Anna has a background uh, at Chalmers and international experience from uh, five global regions. She's very, working currently at Vattenfall and has done so for some years as advisor, which involves uh, setting the strategic direction and driving projects to reach uh, Vattenfall's uh, goals. Uh, and with that being said, I leave the word to Anna. Thank you so much, Eric, and thank you to Sahara and team also that I uh, get to be here in the Industrial Sustainable Transformation Seminar. It's going to be very interesting to, to discuss with all of you, so feel free to, to bring all your questions that you might have. Like Eric said, I worked for a couple of years now at Vattenfall in the sustainer uh, or in the strategy and business development department. So my team is a part of setting the, the direction for, for Vattenfall and file overall and we're also working with some of the the most recent projects and partnerships that we have today so i will share my screen and uh, we will get started so what i would like to speak a little bit about today is what role does the energy sector and electrification uh, itself play for sustainable transformation to achieve that and also I would like to speak a little bit about what strategies that Vattenfall sees as uh, needed in order to reach fossil freedom in, in society. I'll also give some examples of some of the uh, projects and partnerships that we are pr uh, very proud of because in many ways they are the world's first in their field and uh, innovative in their way so we can spend some time there and then also would like to highlight some of the challenges that the businesses and uh, that from our perspective that we see today in, in the challenges to the investment climate uh, that unfortunately makes it a bit tricky to to make sure that, that we can do all the needed investments to to achieve this sustainable transformation so we will also touch upon that but let's start with uh, what role the energy sector can play in 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 uh, in the sustainable transformation and just to start somewhere and um, speak about what, why energy is so important and that is because if we look at this graph here, we can see that the global green gas emissions, I will also make sure I have a laser pointer too. The global green gas emissions that we have globally from per sector, almost three quarters of that is coming from the energy sector. Um, and that is because we use energy in industry, for example, when we produce iron and steel and chemicals, but also because we use it so much energy in transport, especially road transport that is all the fuel that we burn when for for cars and trucks of course and also in aviation and shipping but which is actually fairly less if you consider how much space that's taken in the debate and then also we use a lot of energy when heating our our buildings both our our homes and also other commercial offices and and uh, and stores etc so IEA, the International Energy Agency, have put it that, as that the energy sector holds the key to responding to the world's climate change. And it really is so. That's where so many of the, the aspects that we need to solve start. So that is, uh, that is the, the starting point for also what, what Vattenfall is doing and what we will speak about today. There are many very ambitious climate targets that have been set by different regions in the world, in Europe, but also in, in countries that I'm, I'm sure many of you are aware of. And these are accelerating the, the energy transition. And when we speak about the energy transition, we're often speaking about that electrification itself will be very important for the industry and for transportation and for heating sectors to decarbonize. So that is like a key abatement option to electrify industry processes that before have been using fossil fuels, maybe as the raw material and uh, using electric vehicles instead of using fossil based uh, vehicles, etc. 
And this is driving a big demand for uh, fossil free electricity and heat solutions, but also the actual grids, the networks of, of cables that we have to transport both uh, heat uh, and, uh, and electricity or network of cables. We could also speak about pipelines in, in some uh, cases. Um, and when we look at this, we think of that electrification will be the biggest transformation in society since the industrial revolution, actually. Uh, if we look at this graph, um, around 100 years ago, we started with electrification overall, and that expanded over quite a long time <laughs> during the industrial revolution. And at that time, it was very revolutionary. And in, in Sweden, we actually built, we have had the fastest pace in the world of expanding a nuclear reactor fleet. So that happened during those years. And the ele electricity demand reached a certain level that you can see here that then stayed pretty stable. So during the last 30 years, the electricity that has been needed in Sweden has been at the similar level, and which is basically during my lifetime and maybe uh, my entire lifetime, basically, and maybe for some of you that uh, listen as well, the electricity demand have, have been on the same level. But if we look ahead and in order to achieve the, all the sustainability targets that we need to, to reach net zero globally, we foresee in Sweden that we need to double the electricity demand in just 25 years. So first you can see this dotted graph this is, that is named transition. That is all the electricity that would be needed to re replace fossil free processes in industry or in, in, um, in the transportation sector or the heating sector. A lot of electricity is needed. And then on top of that, we also see new industry uh, linked to hydrogen investments uh, and the producing fossil free steel in, in Sweden that also add an extra need for new electricity. So in just 25 years, we need to double the amount of electricity that uh, we need. And this is a much steeper curve in a, a very less a shorter time span than what you can compare to what happened during the Industrial Revolution. And that is also a, a transition for all parts of society when it comes to municipalities, when it comes to permitting processes, and also companies like Vattenfall and the industry. We will need to many times more do what we already are doing at a faster speed to achieve this. Uh, so it, it's a big challenge that we have ahead of us and something that will be noticeable uh, in society uh, in, in many ways. And uh, we're on, all, only looking at the curve for Sweden, but I heard that the audience is also coming from, from other uh, countries. So we I would say that we see a similar pattern in other countries of, of the world also. We have specifically looked at Netherlands and Germany. And for Germany, this curve uh, looks similar, but the electricity actually needs to quadruple or five times the current level in, in the coming years. And in Netherlands, this might mean that you need to increase the electricity uh, supply with 10 times or 20 times to current level so that is an even bigger challenge and if you look at other countries of the world i'm sure that the curve will look similar and sometimes even steeper uh, than uh, for sweden and and netherlands also because the difference with sweden is that we already have a fairly uh, green electricity supply the electricity that you use in your uh, sockets they're like your when you charge your phone is already fairly uh, green uh, because we have a big supply of, of uh, uh, hydro plants and nuclear in Sweden. But if you charge your phone in other parts of the world, it will be a lot of fossil emissions just from, from that. Um, so that is what a big challenge that we have ahead of us and a little bit the context of electrification and, and energy uh, in Sweden and also in other countries. But I was thinking that we're going to take a look at uh, a little bit of what role Vattenfall can play in this. So I'm going to reshare my screen just to make sure that we have the sound included as well. Our world urgently needs to change and find alternative ways for cleaner powering and heating. 
change has to happen and fast. At Vattenfall, we believe the solution is energy that is free from fossil fuels. We need to change how we live, how we work, how we produce, how we build, how we travel. At Vattenfall, we're determined to power and lead this change. We exist to help all our customers live their lives in ever climate smarter ways and enjoy fossil fuel free lives within one generation. As one of Europe's leading energy companies, our ambition is to become fossil free ourselves. But that's not enough. We also actively seek new partnerships inside and outside the energy industry, searching for new ways to achieve fossil freedom. For instance, we collaborate with the steel industry to develop a method for producing fossil-free steel that emits water instead of carbon dioxide. We help our customers to adopt smart technologies to create their own electricity or heat in an easy and affordable way. We are building a network of charging stations in Northern Europe together with our partners to accelerate the transition to electric cars. Turn fossil fuel. I can reshare again so that we can hear each other also at the same time. Okay, here we go. Maybe you've seen similar, similar but shorter commercials. Uh, let's see. Now we have some battery issues here also. Maybe you have seen similar commercials uh, on television. <laughs> if, if you watch television in Sweden, I'm just going to charge my phone. But maybe it can be hard to um, to know exactly what Vattenfall is doing. Uh, so just to give a short overview is that we are one of, of Europe's uh, uh, largest energy utilities. And we produce electricity from, from nuclear, from wind, and from hydro. Uh, and we also produce heat in different uh, plants. Here on the picture, you see a plant from Uppsala, where we, uh, it's a waste to energy plant. Uh, we also distribute electricity and build grids, uh, both overhead and, and under, under surface type of grids. And we also sell electricity, heat, and, and gas to over 10 million customers. And we also provide uh, energy charging and then the solar panels, et, et cetera. So what is our strategy then when, when it comes to enable fossil freedom uh, in, in society? And that is that we, we want to be a leader in the energy transition. We want to, to ensure that we have this fossil freedom because we believe that we can drive uh, that that can drive society forward. At the same time, we also need to make sure that we are a profitable energy business and therefore building sustainable business cases, not only that they are sustainable in terms of towards the environment, but also financially sustainable is, is always uh, very, very important too, and also socially sustainable, of course. So sustainability is a very core part of our strategy. We usually say that we don't have a sustainability strategy. We have a business strategy and that business strategy is sustainable. Uh, we have set very ambitious climate targets uh, which means that we're going to reach net zero in our full value chain until 2040. Uh, this, we were one of the first uh, countries and utili uh, countries, utilities uh, in the world to get that certified by an organization called the SBTI. So that means that we have a third party who have looked at our plans to reach net zero and that they are, are valid and solid enough and that it looks like we are on the right trajectory to do so. So we have already targets until that we need to deliver upon until 2030 and then uh, in order to become net zero at, in 2040. So that's something we work with a lot and, and something that we collaborate with all our suppliers and our customers also. Um, our, our strategy is also to be an integrated utility and that means that we work across a little bit like I showed before before that we, we supply and produce uh, green electrons, but we also transport them and make sure that they reach our, our customers and industries. So we work across the whole uh, value chain and 
for us that is also a type of business logic where you are integrated uh, fully in the value chain instead of only focusing on one part. So some utilities, for example, they might only focus on building wind, but in many countries globally, but we our strategy is instead to work broadly with everything you can imagine in, within energy, but in fairly few countries. And in that way, we see it as we spread risk. Uh, that is a way for us to, uh, to be able to carry more debt for all our investments, but also to have the knowledge that is needed across the whole value chain to enable this fossil freedom can come to that a little bit later in our partnerships that it's very important to have the knowledge of, of many different sectors and, and, and parts of the energy value chain to enable uh, fossil freedom. We uh, also try to prioritize on a very high level our strategies also to focus on creating value for society and our owner and for us that means that we prioritize business uh, that are sustainable we want to make sure that they have a proper market risk and return level and that we are competitive in them. There are sometimes I get questions on why is Vattenfall not doing this and why is Vattenfall not doing that? Uh, maybe, for example, focusing more on, on solar panels. And sometimes the reason is that we and there are many people that are many companies that could, could build uh, and install solar panels that are very important. But uh, it's also very important that Vattenfall, which is kind of a giant in, in Sweden, focus on doing a couple of those core investments that maybe no other player can do. We also see that that is very important uh, for us to contribute to value creation in society. So on a very high level, we would say that this is our strategy in a nutshell, to focus on being an integrated utility, being a leader, having a, uh, focusing on sustainability targets, and uh, create value for our stakeholders. What also is very important for our strategy is to work with our partners and to find uh, these uh, groundbreaking projects that can contribute to fossil freedom. And what we see is that the complexity of the challenges and, and the, the both technological solutions, but also innovative business models that will be needed for the future um, we cannot achieve them on our own. We need to work cross sectors, cross industries, cross companies to enable fossil free uh, value chains. So here are a couple of examples of, of the partnerships that we are working on right now and, and that we have, have recently uh, delivered upon also. Uh, for example, we have, uh, and maybe you have heard that also, we have been a part of developing the world's first fossil free steel in a pilot project together with SSAB and LKAB. And what is so revolutionary about this is that instead of using coal in the process, we're using hydrogen, which means that the only waste product of, of the steel, um, uh, the direct reduction of the iron, is uh, water instead of carbon dioxide. Um, and this is a project that could not be a, have been achieved if we were not partnering, partnering with a mining company, a steel company, and also us as the electricity contributor in that and our knowledge of, of, of tying it together with also finding a way to store the hydrogen. That was also a world's first in that project that we were building a hydrogen storage. Um, so that is more both a technical uh, project, of course, uh, that is that was revolutionary in, in that way. Uh, another thing that is also more on the technical side uh, is that we are aiming to produce the world's first uh, sustainable aviation fuel uh, on the west coast of Sweden, where we will use captured carbon dioxide from our our uh, plant in Uppsala, that was the plant that you saw in the picture before of district heating, because when you burn plastic and burn different waste, that emits uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So we are aiming to capture that carbon, ship it to the other side of Sweden, and also uh, use that carbon dioxide together with um, fossil free electricity, and uh, in uh, a specific process then produce um, uh, aviation fuel. So instead of using uh, new fossils as a raw material, you're using captured CO2 emissions. So then when that fuel is being burnt, uh, it is emitting 
um, CO2 emissions into the atmosphere that already were in the system. So this is a little bit of an innovative way also of making sure that we can actually use the CO2 emissions that are already emitted into the atmosphere instead of putting up new raw materials. Uh, so we are also careful to say that we are not uh, avoiding CO2 emissions that otherwise would not have come, but we're making use of what already is there. While in the, the hybrid fossil free case, we would uh, then uh, that would be completely avoiding CO2 emissions uh, into the atmosphere then by, by producing steel in that way. Another also pretty technological heavy, but maybe in a different way, is that we are focusing and aiming to produce the world's first hydrogen production offshore. So that means that uh, all the hydrogen that also will be needed for different processes, for example, for producing steel, but also in the industry, a lot of hydrogen will be used as the energy carrier uh, going forward and not only electricity. But to produce hydrogen requires a lot of electricity. <laughs> so a part of that curve that we looked at in the beginning is driven by that we will need to produce more hydrogen. When that hydrogen is produced, we want to use a renewable or fossil-free energy resource. And we also want to make sure that we have as, as high energy efficiency as uh, possible in that process. So one thing that is being explored is to put hydrogen production, which is uh, uh, use, uh, it's what we use as an ele electrolyzer, to put that electrolyzer directly next to a wind turbine. So this is uh, off the shore of Aberdeen in the UK. We are trying to put an electrolyzer on top of a wind turbine. And that is the first time that has happened. So therefore the project is called HT1, Hydrogen Turbine 1. And there are many challenges that come with that because uh, you are in a very extreme environment with a lot of salt water, etc. And then whenever you have produced that hydrogen, you need to ship it to shore in, in pipes, etc. So and there is a lot of, of work ongoing there to make sure that we in an efficient way can produce hydrogen with very low uh, energy losses. So those projects are, are more uh, revolutionary on together with different partners ensuring that we are finding ways, uh, new ways to produce uh, products that before have been produced, but in a with a fossil uh, based uh, raw materials or, or electricity. So this is a new way of producing the same type of product. Uh, the other products that we have on, on this slide as, exla ex as examples is uh, innovative in different ways, uh, perhaps. Perhaps with how you work with a value chain or how you work with partners to enable a business model. So uh, another project that we work with is uh, that we hope to create the world's cleanest dirt bike together with a company named Cake. And with the cake, we are picking apart this entire dirt bike into all its components. Uh, and we're looking at all the plastics and rubber and metals that are being used by this electric dirt bike. And we're trying to figure out how can this component be produced in a more fossil free way? Can we exchange it for another material? Can we make it like, can we use the material less? Can we decrease the volume of the material? Can we use recycled material? Or can we uh, change the production of the material, uh, material to make sure that it is as clean as possible? So what you see on the picture is actually uh, the cube is illustrating the CO2 emission footprint of this bike that we are trying to make as, as small as possible with, by working with the value chain and all the components in, 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 a, in a fairly new uh, innovative uh, way. Something else that we are, have done is that we are a founding member of uh, something called the First Movers Coalition. And this is something that is very close to my heart because that is a project that I get to work on. And on the picture here, you can see our, our CEO is, is standing there together with uh, John Kerry and Bill Gates, etc. And because this is a coalition that is formed by World Economic Forum and the US uh, Congress State Department. Uh, with the aim to um, engage and mobilize different companies to commit to procuring green materials for the value chain in the future. So that means that we have committed to, to that we will procure uh, ourselves for building our wind towers, et cetera, 
10% fossil free steel and, and also sustainable aviation fuel and concrete in the future. And the purpose with this is that we need to make sure that these breakthrough technologies are commercialized in the future. Are commercialized now so that these technologies are available on a broad mass scale uh, in the future. Uh, many of the technologies, they estimate that around 50% of the technologies that we need uh, in 2050 uh, to reach net zero don't exist yet. They are not mature yet and have not reached the commercial scale. So by being a part of, of a First Movers Coalition, we are hoping to send a demand signal and kind of walk the talk and say that we will also commit to procuring these materials, even if they cost a premium right now, in order for these technologies to be available on a mass scale uh, in 2030 and also beyond. So that is something that we are working on there to get these green materials into our value chain and encourage investors to uh, invest and, and the suppliers to be uh, ready to, to uh, use these breakthrough technologies and, and there to bet on them uh, by showing that there is a demand in the market. Something else that we uh, have done is that we have built the world's largest unsubsidized wind park. So this is also a, a breakthrough type of partnership where we partnered up with BASF, that is one of the world's largest producer of uh, chemicals, to co-invest in a wind park. And the, um, BASF then will use the electrons, the electricity from this wind park to produce the their chemicals in a more uh, sustainable way. And, and by doing that, by co-investing together and entering into this partnership, we could build a wind park. And instead of using grants from uh, the government, which has been used for many years in wind parks to make them uh, profitable, we were able to do this in, in a, as a standalone business case. And that itself is also innovative and also something that is very important then for future to make sure that we can invest in, in these uh, business models in, in a financially sustainable way and as a standalone uh, business uh, product and, and case, so to say. So here are our different, we're doing much more than this. So I had to choose and uh, very carefully to 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 not uh, spend all, all our time here today. But as you can see, we are collaborating across the whole energy value chain and we are collaborating with, with companies in chemical sector and in, in transport sector um, because we believe that this is what is needed uh, for society. We could not do this on our own, but we also know that these other companies could not do it on their own. So these very, uh, they, they require a lot of work to pull off these partnerships and it's not always uh, evident that that they form so that's it's something we spend a lot of time on and, and that is very core for uh, what we think are our own future growth but also to achieve our sustainability targets and for society to achieve their sustainability targets then. Um, the next section I wanted to speak about is a little bit more on the challenges because as you know there we are struggling uh, with inflation in society right now and uh, Europe it's facing a, a recession in many ways uh, and many of course individuals and, and households are also struggling in this um, and this is um, affecting the investment climate. Uh, fairly recently, we could see that uh, Vattenfall and other utility companies too uh, decided to not build wind farms that are very much needed because the investment case is not coming together. Uh, so that, that is very unfortunate. And, and that also shows that the complexity of the problem, we cannot only look at the sustainability or the energy sector per se, it's very really linked closely linked to uh, societal development and uh, the, the health of the economy as well. Other challenges that are more linked to our, our, our the development of, of energy resources also is that whenever you build a wind farm or, or other aspects, 
we have a challenge with permitting um, we need to make sure that that the permitting is happening faster if we're going to be able to build out at the scale that you saw in the beginning we also need to make sure that the grill grid is built up at the speed that is required with all the cables that are needed it's, it's very challenging to make sure that those kilometer tens thousands of kilometers of, of cable can be drawn also and and of course there are also a lot of other societal interests at stake here uh, that we also need to take in consideration so that's why we have written that the balanced interest it's, it's very important, but it's also a challenge, of course, that we have different interests uh, to, at the same time, enable um, the sustainable transition, the energy transition, but we also have the military with their demands. We also have a Sami population, a local population that needs to have their interests met and their voices heard in many ways. So that is, of course, also a challenge uh, that we need to overcome. Uh, we also, whenever we invest, invest in weather dependencies, need to take that into consideration. That means that we invest in weather dependent assets, uh, that the wind is not blowing at all times, the sun is not always shining, and we need to make sure that we have electricity whenever it is needed, even, even if the wind is not blowing. Uh, the last challenge I wanted to highlight also is that we need a lot of people, <laughs> as you can imagine, if we have been at this electricity level for the last 30 years to suddenly double the electricity level in Sweden, we need a lot of people to, to pull that off. And it's actually a bottleneck in, in several of our markets that we don't have enough people working on the different topics so that the competence is not always there. Uh, so this is also a call that we need we need more people so everyone is definitely welcome to join the energy sector and work on these topics uh, that is listening on this call but to end on a little bit more of a positive note we are exploring uh, a lot of uh, new technologies and opportunities uh, also to evolve our own portfolio as a company and in order to reach net zero so we are we are really set our we have really set our mind on to overcome these challenges we're looking into new in industry decarbonization partnerships we are uh, evaluating if we should invest in small modular nuclear reactors for example and also different types of, of storage solutions uh, onshore and large-scale solar and also also green gas so I've been speaking a lot now and I would be very happy to hear from you and, and to hear about your insights and, and your questions. So we can, we can jump to that, to a little bit of a, of a Q&A session and I will stop sharing my screen here for, for a second. Wow, thank, thanks Anna. That, that was a really inspiring talk, super interesting. Uh, so now I... Uh... Open up the questions to the attendees to our seminar. So if you have a question, please just open up your mic and you're welcome to use that or write in our chat. And while the questions come up, and I was one of the things that I was wondering about during your, your presentation is that uh, uh, is uh, Vattenfall uh, help? I, I saw that, that a big segment of the energy consumption or challenge uh, of the future uh, includes the manufacturing sector and uh, in the industry in, in, in general. And I was wondering if uh, is uh, Vattenfall currently helping uh, or, or has as a, as a business type of model uh, that of, of helping uh, customers in the industrial sector uh, improve energy efficiency? Uh, that is, is a very good question. So energy efficiency will be very important, uh, definitely for the future. And I think that that is one of the key strategies that Sweden has set out also to reach our sustainability targets. The way we work with energy efficiency is, is uh, mainly focused on how can you optimize the, the energy system that you might have as a, on a factory. So we are, are pretty good at, at working with storages and, and maybe how can you use this battery and this heat storage when the electricity is uh, electricity price is high or, or lower 
and um, and how can you then optimize this entire system that you have with the electricity that you have access to the storage and your electricity need but otherwise we don't have it i know that there are many also products for for energy efficiency and maybe also often on a household level and and for commercial stores that you can use also to reach more efficiency in, in fridges and heat systems etc but we, we we don't offer offer such products yet thank you do we have uh, other questions from the audience Surprisingly silent. I'm usually getting a lot of questions on nuclear and, <laughs> and wind. <laughs> what do you think about this um, sustainability metrics? Uh, Lawrence has a question on that. We are annually um, publishing a annual sustainability report. So that is something that you can find on our website if you're interested in, in sustainability metrics. So we are monitoring most heavily our CO2 emissions. And if we are following that trajectory to reach net zero in 2040, uh, but we also have other sustainability metrics. And I think we have in one of the front pages of that report, which is hundreds of pages, we also calculate what is our true contribution to society if you add our profit together with our foot and deduct our footprint and our social impact what how could you evaluate your company and i know that that is a, a specific method that that many sustainability accountants are starting to to use more and more so so you can you can find our our report and, and read up more on it there if it's interesting Mm. Thanks, and I see that there is a, a, a new question coming up, and I think this is, this is very similar to the case that you presented at Cake, and it says, uh, do you work with producers, suppliers, uh, in terms of recollection of spent equipment to help achieve greater uh, recycling, for example, batteries, uh, now that mm. batteries are such a hot topic these days, and I guess related to energy production? Hmm. It's a great, it's a great question. I uh, we have worked on a project to recycle our wind blades, which uh, is fiberglass type of products that can either be reused again, or in other types of products. So that's that's something I I, I know that we worked on. We also have a collaboration with Northvolt that has uh, set aside a great plan to recycle their batteries. But I know that Europe has been a little a bit behind uh, Asia on, on recycling batteries. So, um, but we have, um, we're not using that many batteries in our own value chain. I would say that right now it's because the batteries are fairly small today and not yet, um, maybe it's, maybe it's not pro profitable to store electricity. So I would say the, the major, probably up to 90% of our energy is it's not stored it's it's uh, it's produced and consumed at the same time as you are producing it basically uh, but what we have in sweden uh, is that we have now i'm this is a little bit off topic of the question but we have um, hydro plants in sweden that function as, as large batteries also so we that that helps to balance the the energy system there but we we are aiming to set a more circularity uh, vision for for Vattenfall. What should be our policy and vision on circularity? So that's something that we work on, and especially now the wind towers that we have are not so old. But at some point, all these wind towers are going to start to decommission also, and that means that you have uh, many tons of steel that could uh, hopefully be used again. And so it's definitely one of our plans to. Um, when we try to decarbonize our footprint from steel in our own value chain to look more into how can we use scrap steel, uh, both by from our own value chain, but also using scrap steel from the market. So I would say scrap steel is, is our mo biggest focus right now, but uh, we have already accomplished something within the wind turbine blades and the batteries and the rest is, is a little bit less focused, but something that we are working on. Great. I will try to make two questions out of uh, one question out of two uh, because they are both very uh, very much related, uh, and I guess it's a questions uh, related to resilience of these uh, weather related energy sources. 
I suppose mm. that uh, given that uh, we see more and more of these uh, phenomena of uh, drought or or uh, changing uh, weather seasons, uh, how how does Vattenfall take into account this uh, th this occurrences such as, for example, droughts or wildfires or is this something related to the weather related energy sourcing we have uh, um, we have uh, looked at different scenarios for the future the weather is changing uh, always uh, in a way but we, we so that's something where we have we are subject to weather changes but of course more extreme weather changes are to come uh, um, in in Sweden, I, I would say in all markets, we're not as affected of droughts as, as unfortunately other markets are. We are more, um, what we see more is that we might see more rain, uh, which uh, in that way, it makes it a little bit different. We might need to operate our hydro plants in a different way, but at the same time, that gives us more water to use for electricity production. Um, so in that way, it's good. But otherwise, I would say that it's often a debate of different uh, uh, resources, of course, on assets. And I would say that Vattenfall's perspective, I can show this slide uh, while we're at it, is that all fossil-free technologies will be needed. They all have very different uh, benefits. Some of them, uh, for example, wind can, onshore wind can be produced at a very low cost, which of course is good. Offshore, uh, you can, you're not having as much of a land footprint, which sometimes is good. And with nuclear, you are not weather dependent. So all of them have pros and cons, but we think that all fossil free technologies will be needed to, to be able to double our our electricity uh, supply uh, for the next uh, 25 years. Mm -hmm. Then there is uh, uh, one, perhaps one last question that we can take in today's seminar would be uh, related to the competences uh, for for supporting uh, Vattenfall's need. And uh, the question is, how, how do you achieve this? Uh, is it developing more in-house training programs? Or is it external competences, uh, for example, uh, the new engineers that are being produced by universities? Uh, mm. how, how do you manage this, this uh, competence? Mm. It's a great question and something that we are thinking about a lot, actually. Um, they, I, I didn't know that when I started at Vattenfall, but we actually have a Vattenfall gymnasium, apparently. <laughs> so we, it, it's, we are even trying to invest in, in uh, education in that way. We're also trying to collaborate with the government to, to highlight what areas of competent, competence that are needed. And especially now, if, if Sweden and Vattenfall will invest more in nuclear in the future, that uh, we will need a lot of nuclear resources already now that we're trying to highlight that that could be needed and as you know it might take five or ten years if, to have new students and graduates come out and we have not built nuclear in Sweden for 50 years so we're trying to be strategic in that way otherwise there is a lot of in-house competence at Vattenfall to learn from so I would say that we're, we're learning a lot from each other uh, we are learning a lot from our partners and we uh, even people who have worked in the energy sector for 25, 30 years are extremely humble, I might say. So it's a very uh, nice environment to work in because everyone recognizes that it's so complex that you always need to continue asking questions and learn. And we have a lot of training programs on that. Uh, and we also have a recognition of that we need to go to seminars. We need to, to send people to different uh, conferences, etc., to constantly learn. And maybe that's something I, I was surprising at the... Um, when I started at Vattenfall was that I, I'm often working with questions where I'm like, I cannot Google this in any way because it's not gonna exist. The only resource I have is to pick up the phone and call a colleague and say, how would you solve this problem? So it's it's a constant learning in, in, in that way. Mm. Super interesting. Uh, and with that uh, last question, we close the seminar for today. Uh, nothing left to say, but thank you, Anna, for such an insightful presentation. And thank you uh, for having me. Yeah, yeah, stay tuned for the next seminar series in the Industrial Transformation Platform. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.